innovation is something that we've needed like never before. Well, what a timely uh, moment for Lord Matt Ridley, Tory peer and author, to bring out his new book, How uh, Innovation Works. I'm delighted to welcome uh, Lord Ridley to the show. Good morning to you. Good morning, Julia. Good morning. Very nice to be with you. Lovely to talk to you. We're going to go a little bit uh, more personal. Just go with Matt for the rest of the interview, if you don't yes, please. mind. Um, now, um, I, I, you've, you've been tweeting an awful lot about this book, and I do follow you on Twitter. And um, and it is fascinating how often um, this book, written long before the pandemic, of course, hit us, but how often the, 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 the stories that you tell in this book are relevant to what we're going through right now. Yeah, indeed. I mean, I have a whole chapter chapter that's mostly about vaccines and the incredible invention of them. Uh, a brilliant woman turns out to be a key uh, play a key role in it. Uh, but this woman called Lady Mary uh, Wortley Montague, who was the wife of the ambassador in Constantinople, she picked up this habit that uh, out there in the Ottoman Empire they were inoculating their children against smallpox. She brought it back. Incredibly unpopular. A lot of anti-vax sentiment at the time. Nobody knew how, how it worked for several centuries, but vaccination has saved more lives than probably uh, anything. And so that's just an example of the kind of innovation that we've had. And yet. I also write about two women who invented the whooping cough vaccine in the 1930s in four years flat. That would be quite good going today. It yeah. still takes many years to develop a vaccine, and that is a failure. It's an example of how we've been living through an innovation famine. We think because of the digital world moving so fast, it's a time of rapid innovation. But I don't think that's the case. If you look at things like vaccination uh, and uh, medical devices and so on. It takes so long to get approval for these things that most people don't try and we've got a dearth of things coming through and we're now paying the price. Yeah, and of course also there's there's not that much money in these things as a general rule. There's a lot more money in uh, in, in products which you can get people to take for years and years on end, you know, the statins and the like that, that get developed rather than the vaccines. Um, now, you, you make an interesting point in the book about the difference between innovation, which is what your book's about, and invention. And, and, and those are completely different things. But I don't think most of us have perhaps ever thought about that distinction. Well, what is that distinction? Yeah, well, the inventor is the guy who jumps out of the bath and runs down the street like Archimedes did saying Eureka, um, whereas the innovator is the person who then turns that insight into something practical, affordable and reliable that we can all use. And my argument is that the inventor's been given too much credit uh, over the course of history and the in innovators been given too little people like thomas edison or jeff bezos he's not an inventor of anything but he's someone who has um created an online world more than almost anyone else uh, that we can use so uh, innovation is a lot of hard work uh, it's trial and error it's not sexy uh, it's not uh, eureka it's not dramatic um, but it is actually terribly uh, important there's a lovely story that charles towns the inventor of the laser used to tell which is a beaver and a rabbit looking at the hoover dam and the beaver says to the rabbit no i didn't build it but it is based on an idea of mine <laughs> and that's a bit like the way a lot of inventors think that their ideas have been kind of uh, hijacked by these boring businessmen who turn them into something useful but actually uh, i think we d we need to rebalance the credit a bit absolutely well, you mentioned thomas edison there and, and there's a story to tell about his role with the light bulb yeah, I mean, he's not the inventor of the light bulb. He's one of 21 different people who came up with light bulbs around the same time. He wasn't the first by any means. But he was the one who then did an incredibly long slog through pretty well every plant he could find till he found a particular kind of Japanese bamboo uh, which made the perfect filament for the light bulb. So he was the one who made the light bulb reliable. Before that, like you could have light bulbs, but they always went pop after about an hour or two. Whereas he made light bulbs that would last a longer time, and he realized that was incredibly important if you were ever going to get them taken up. So um, uh, he's the one who said, uh, Innov actually, he said invention, but I think he meant innovation, uh, is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, there's been a lot of concern. I mean, yeah, we did think we'd spend the whole year talking about Brexit and the end of the uh, uh, of the transition period. There's this concern we've heard from the scientific, the, the, the intellectual community that, that we were going to lose innovation. We'll lose scientific developments because we're leaving the EU, because we're going to lose all that funding. But 
Um, do most of the the things that are the, either invented or the innovations that, that turn them into products that we use every day or could be life saving in circumstances where we've got a pandemic, do they come about as a result of someone sort of thinking we need to invent this, we need to innovate and develop that, and then we're going to put government funding in, and then it's all going to happen? Is there this sort of this very linear route for these things happening, or is a lot more of it trial and error? accidental discoveries and accidental applications yeah it's much more pull uh, pull and push it's what the it's what the consumer wants and expresses through the market um, uh, stimulates uh, experiments many of which fail uh, and if you set out to try and invent one thing and develop a, a technology that will do one thing you'll almost certainly fail what you have to do is prepare be prepared to change direction to change your mind to to, to use serendipity to to listen to someone who comes in from an unexpected direction with an unexpected suggestion there's a beautiful case history uh, of this where in 1903 two people took to the air um within 10 days of each other in the United States. One was government funded. He was called Samuel Langley. He had a huge government grant. He'd worked in secret. He had his plan for how to build an airplane. Uh, he didn't consult anyone. Um, uh, and it went splash into the water of the Potomac within 20 feet. Uh, the other was a bicycle mechanic, a couple of brothers who were bicycle mechanics from Dayton, Ohio, who talked to everyone they could think of, who'd built hundreds of gliders, who tested things in wind tunnels, uh, who had, were working on a shoestring, uh, and they got into the air. And of course, I'm talking about Orville and Wilbur Wright there. So um, there's a nice, the, 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 and, and I'm afraid the story is that if government decides it can pick winners and decide what innovation it wants to happen next, it will usually fail. It might succeed. I mean, you know, nuclear weapons were a case where uh, they took a a very rough idea and said, you know, if we poured money and effort into this, we might develop a nuclear weapon before the end of the war. And they did achieve that. But it's a relatively rare phenomenon that much more likely uh, it comes about unexpectedly. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the interesting thing. And that's suppose the lessons we bring it back to what's happening to us today. So many of the different projects that we're looking at that, that, uh, that may well deliver a, a vaccine or, or, or treatment or a cure for coronavirus or, or, or other ways for us to deal with and handle this, they're going to come from the sort of innovation that you, you've been talking about in your book, aren't they? They may well not come from something that the government or any government around the world decides to do. Um, tell, us, tell us what you've been looking at in that field. Well, there's a, there's a very nice example of, I think, doing this right, which is the Gates Foundation said there's a bacterium called pneumococcus that kills a lot of children in poor countries. Uh, it only happens in poor countries, so there's not much of a market for the pharmaceutical industry to develop a vaccine for this. But if you, the pharmaceutical industry, can go out and develop a vaccine for this, we will offer you a prize, a reward. And the reward will come in the form of topping up the price you get for every dose of the vaccine that you sell. Um, so that you have to actually go and make it. You know, you can't just say I've invented it and then yeah. collect the prize and go off to the Bahamas. Um, so uh, it worked really well. Um, there are three vaccines now in production as a result of that prize being dangled in front of industry. Uh, and uh, they've saved three quarters of a million lives already in the last few years. So wow. uh, that's a, a really nice example of not saying I'm going to back you because I think you've got the best project. But whoever can solve this problem and show me they've solved it, I'll reward you at the end of the day. So I think we, we should be using prizes a lot more and patents and grants a lot less. Yes, yeah, there's more of the, the incentive for getting it right and delivering. It. And that's the key thing is, is delivering it. Isn't it? Um, just just finally, you, you've um, I mean, you, you're also author of, of other bestseller books. So the Rational Optimist is, is obviously your biggest bestseller, bestseller today. Um, and, 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 and in terms of where we are right now, there's been so much doom and gloom. Um, so much sort of, you know, well, the end of times, you know, the, the, uh, you know we're all, the planet's going to be destroyed. The human population is, is a terrible thing for the planet. Um, everything's going to, to, to hell, you know, hell in a handcart. Um, you, you take a, a much more positive view of the world and the human race, largely because you are a rational optimist and you, this is mind blowing everyone, you look at the actual facts. Um, what's your, <laughs> what's your, your, just your general sort of summary, your take of where we are, even in the middle of a pandemic, a global pandemic, what is your take of where we are in the world? Yeah, well, I'm still an optimist because um, 10 years ago when I wrote that book, everyone said you can't possibly be an optimist. We're in the middle of a great financial crisis. And then a year or two later, they said, what about the euro crisis? And then the, what about the Euro war in Ukraine? And then what about the war in Syria? You can't still be an optimist. Right. So every year, 
that I've gone around the world talking about this. People have said, but you can't still be. Actually, this has been the best decade for Africa, for example, on record. Uh, the income of the average Ethiopian has doubled in the last 10 years. That's an incredible uh, transformation. And a lot of people thought it couldn't happen to Africa, and they were wrong. So um, even if it hasn't been a great decade in the West, uh, we are still all going in the right direction. And the 1930s were a pretty awful decade, particularly in America, but they were a very inventive decade, actually. A lot of things like nylon and computers started to be developed. Uh, so uh, the fact that we are in a spell of economic horror for the next few months, if not years, and I'm afraid that is likely because of this pandemic, um, doesn't mean that innovation won't happen. We've already seen, just the way we've all migrated online, yep. how innovation is changing our world as a result of this pandemic. And that, I think, will lead to growth and prosperity in the future. I'm still very optimistic about the future of the human race in general. Wonderful. Nice to end on that happy note. Lord Matt Ridley, uh, author of How Innovation Works, the hardback is out right now. Thank you very much indeed for joining us.